right. Hello and welcome back. Um, you can hear me now, right? I can hear you. Let me check while you're here. Let me pop well, over to YouTube and that's see. That's probably a good idea because I can see in the monitor now that the thing is moving. Like I got out of the habit of checking that because I naively assumed that my audio worked fine. And yeah. you know what happens so audio... kids, when you assume. <laughs> oh, wait. That's the old one. Sorry. That's friend. the old one. I deleted the old one on LinkedIn. We go back. I think if you go to just franksworld.tv. I see live. I'm, I'm just, I'm cool. I mean, I'm, I feel confident because I see the, the audio monitor going up. I and hear down. So cool. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So We're both up. in, in the time that it took me to troubleshoot this, Andy hopped on. So hey, say hello to the folks, Andy. Although I'm sure if you're watching this, you probably know, already know who Andy is. <laughs> Uh, I am back in the studio and I mixed up last night that fancy new like intro graphic uh, because I was inspired by another intro graphic I had seen. Cool. Um, and um, for some reason, I put that together in Canva, if you can believe that. So like I believe it. I've um, seen the work you do in Canva. Canva is incredible. Like it, and see, it is, you, you uh, know this already. Part of the reason I stink at it is because you're awesome at it. And I say, hey, I need a graphic that does this. <laughs> and in like three minutes you send me one we're a good team um <laughs> but um no nah, so like it was uh it's interesting you know we're gonna talk about open source tech textbooks and things like that and the multi-arm bandit thing and we're gonna go through part of uh the presentation i did at reinvent um right here um because uh why not right um sure. And um, although it is, if you want to see the original raw recording, it is on uh, YouTube. So you can go to franksworld.com, just search for reInvent. Uh, it's in there. Um, yeah. Uh, I so was I'll quite... clarify Frank's going to do this. I got to go back and do some of my day job. Yeah. But, sorry uh, about that. Yeah. So no, that's you're... okay. It's, it's good, but there's a possibility that, you're that drop. later today, Frank and I will be back on my stream. That's right. And uh, and and we'll do it the opposite. We're probably we can do the thing on Frank's wall if you want to do it. Um, oh, whatever. I mean, I can always there's a thing up here. I haven't tried yet where I can add my channels to our stream. Really? Yeah, it's up at the very top. And it's it, it, I've been getting notified about it since the I don't know, since the beginning of the month or something. Add They've channels. been doing a lot of good stuff with Restream and shout out to Restream right? because. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I did ping their support. They gave me a list of things to troubleshoot. So I get the old, um, the old, the big fancy mic as opposed to the headset. <laughs> the, BFM. the BFM. The like BFM. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, that could go in multiple directions. I don't know about that. Um, the big fancy mic. That's what we meant. All right. So get your, get, get your minds out of the gutter, kids. Um, exactly. But um so uh, this is an this is an interesting talk. So what we're gonna do is, yeah. uh, in the time that I realized, like, oh no, I have no audio again, uh, I was like, you know what? Let me load up some other material I can share to make this stream better. Assuming you can hear me. So uh, with that, I do have an audio, a video clip, five minutes. Andy may or may not be on the call af after we show up. Yeah, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna jump, but it's it's really good stuff. If you haven't, yeah. I saw the uh, I saw the YouTube version of this. Mm -hmm. I know Frank well enough to know that uh, this is going to be equally good. Oh, well, so thank you. Uh, do do check this out. Uh, if you're watching this, of course, you are checking it out. Well, let's mention this again uh, if we get to do this thing later today. Um, and just as kind of a teaser for that, I am going to be sharing a little bit that I've learned more about ADF triggers, kind of advanced nice. stuff on Azure Data Factory triggering. And I am super excited to share. But I'm going to jump off now, Frank. Take it away. All right. Have a great I'm time. I'm going to play the bumper for uh, Fedora Fridays. All right. Awesome. Talk to you later, Andy. All right, bro. So we're back. My name is Frank Lavinia. Big shout out to Andy uh, for hopping on, helping me troubleshoot yet again my audio problems with uh, um, the stream. Uh, you can check me out at Frank Diggs Data, franksworld.com, datadriven.tv, and impactquantum.com. So let's go to the presentation deck.
All right. So I might jump around some slides, but ultimately uh, the solution that you're about to see is built on top of this wonderful partnership that uh, AWS and Red Hat have. Um, there's a service called Red Hat OpenShift Service on AWS, uh, and it really empowers developers to innovate. Uh, it's a managed turnkey application platform um, and with flexible pricing and reduced operational complexity. Because here's the thing, infrastructure often gets in the way of innovation, right? And we'll see that writ large in the demo uh, with Boston University. Um, so uh, this is a fully managed service. Like this is a self-service deployment to create Red Hat OpenShift clusters in moments and minutes. Billing from AWS for both OpenShift and AWS services. Uh, so there's one source of, of billing. Uh, and it's a native AWS service, right? That can be accessed on demand from the AWS Management Console. Uh, and you get the best of both Red Hat and AWS in terms of security and compliance with industry-specific standards and regulations. All right, so let's talk now a little bit about something that is a little nearer and dearer to my heart, uh, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. And Red Hat OpenShift Data Science is, um, it is a cloud service that is, um, provides the core data science workflow on top of ROSA or Red Hat OpenShift. Um, and you have increased capabilities and collaboration and essentially it's Jupyter Notebooks as a service. So let me double click into that. Um, what the importance of this Notebooks as a service uh, tools are. Um, this is the Jupyter Notebooks. If you're a data scientist, you know this, that this the Jupyter no Notebooks are the de facto tool for data science. And basically it provides a robust, scalable GPU um, supported environment to do compute. And this basically means that data scientists don't have to think about the infrastructure. Infrastructure people can leave all the headaches to all the infrastructure, the IT operations over to AWS and Red Hat, right? This is really a win-win for everyone else. And um, the vision for uh, Boston University, AWS and Red Hat partnered together to provide this. And ultimately, this effort provides students with a rich, full-fledged Linux experience that hides no details and yet can be easily accessed uh, and integrated into existing teaching materials and methodologies. But more than that, more than that, this is really opening up a whole open source um, uh, approach to education. This is really opening up this new world of, um, of open source textbooks and open source education and exploring that. Uh, so I'm gonna explore that a little deeper, but first, uh, you know what? Why don't we just hear it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Here's Professor uh, Jonathan Apavu uh, at, from Boston University. Let's see if I can cue that. Hi, everyone. Yep. Um, first, my uh, sincere apologies. I unfortunately had a sinus flare up uh, and I've been asked not to travel which is really an unfortunate thing because I was really hoping to get a chance to meet with everyone and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing here. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think I'd first like to thank Hugh Brock and Heidi Dempsey of Red Hat Research because what we've done here is a really interesting sort of synergy or collaboration between what is possible when tying academia and industrial know-how and on platforms like AWS, which just are rock solid and can scale. Uh, so I really wanna thank Red Hat for helping draw this story. Uh, well, going from story to something that can actually be real and that I can use and put it in front of 300 students. Um, so I, let me just give you a brief, uh, overview of the problems sort of we were facing and then you know you'll get a chance to um, see some of the demo that Frank and others have tried to put together for you so you know it's it's really a fascinating world we live in when so much of computer systems that underlie almost everything we do you come in contact as a child via things like you know an iPad 
or a smartphone. And it causes this huge schism between what your experience of a computer is and what's actually going on under the covers. And perhaps in the old days, it was sort of a very straightforward thing, right? I mean, some computer science department set up a Unix server, you got an account on it, you went to a terminal room, <laughs> talk about a distraction-free environment, and you had to write code at a command prompt. Uh, and then, you know, we evolved that to things like SSH. But really, between our dramatic increase in scale, like, so my next semester is 300 I'm from that. Initials. Computing is as a software computer scientist down to how does it all really work? And this has always been a problem. How do we bridge that gap? between concept, reality, and it being really based on real skills. And Red Hat was, you know, has this platform, which built out of open source, has constructed for data science, right? Jupyter Books and Jupyter Notebooks are really a data science platform. And some of us got the crazy idea that, hey, you know something, if you squint, we might be able to actually just turn this into a good old fashioned terminal desktop based environment, all accessible through a web browser, but it's containerized. Secondly, all the lecture material and in-class experience could be on exactly the same platform because in reality, it's not just the terminal server and my student experience at the time when they go back to their dorm rooms and they're hacking away at code, on the other hand, is like a classic sitting in the dark with a green terminal and you're trying to figure out what to do. So, and finally, of course, the final component being of that though, the necessity to scale that. So it turns out that this containerized uh, data science platform, right? running on top of an on-demand service like Amazon really is our best of all worlds. We are back to the future. We've got a terminal-based environment to teach everything from out of real software all the way up to our lecture materials and our discussion materials and our textbook all in one place. So I hope with that you um, get a sense of the real power that at least we've found to be leveraged from the kind of relationships we're seeing where cloud platforms are empowering not just um, someone out there on their uh, smartphone, but all the way across the stack to allowing us to educate future computer scientists. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, first. All right. So um, thank you, uh, Professor Apavu. Uh, awesome guy. I love to have him on a proper live stream where you can kind of interact a little bit more, but that will have to wait to another day. Um, so what I'm going to show you now, and if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I will answer them as I see them. And if you're watching them later, I do always try to get to the uh, to the uh, responses um, in due time. So I wanna show you kind of the architecture here. And this is really kind of key because part of the power of this is what you don't see. Uh, part of the power of this, um, uh, the work that's been done here is what you don't see in kind of the, uh, can we do this now? I'll just, um, I'll take one for the team and uh, go to the corner. Uh, what you don't see is, all of this stuff right you don't see all of this you don't see all of these workers or these instances and whatnot 
you don't see, we didn't really talk about this in this presentation, but the idea of creating custom notebook images. Um, you know, everyone wants to, um, everyone wants to transform education. Every organization wants to digitally transform, right? But what does that mean, right? Well, the reality is that infrastructure gets in the way of innovation. And the same as holds true in academia, maybe even more. Um, and, and ultimately what you're seeing is, let's see, pop myself back to the bottom. Uh, what you're seeing here is kind of that in action. They wanted to add 300 students to this workload, right? Uh, they had about nine members of faculty and they had two admins, right? These folks already had a full-time job. These folks were already busy, right? So the idea of provisioning in this and working on this on premises with their existing hardware was just not palatable. So in the span of weeks, and keep in mind, this was weeks, we set this up in December for uh, January classes. So about a year ago, uh, they were able to scale with their existing admins, their existing faculty, and add this workload of three to 500 students per semester. I think he said 500, but uh, the first test case was uh, 300. Now let that sink in, right? If you're already working with cloud, you're already familiar with this sort of thing, this is probably not news to you, right? This idea of being able to be elastic, right? It scales up, it scales down. But for a lot of organizations who uh, just insist on kind of doing things the way they've already done it, always done it, uh, this ends up being a nightmare. Now, um, one thing, another thing I want to point out is because all of this stuff happens in, uh, in browser, what you don't have, again, what you don't see uh, is you don't have, um, hang on, there we go. That's what I want to show. I'll show all the animations, right? You not only have improvement in operational efficiency, basically they doubled their workload, right? Um, the setup time is ridiculously small. All they have to do is log in to the cluster and um, everything's set up for them, right? There's even a custom image that's created just for the university, just for this course, actually. Uh, and this is, um, you know, 600% reduction, right? I mean, this is a fancy way of saying that uh, office hours don't become tech support hours, right? Because if you were installing Linux, hey, what's up, Diggs? I saw you the other day. How's it going, man? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Um, so, um, so, so ultimately, the professors, when they introduce technology, and this has been a big barrier for technology in the classroom, right, for a number of years, and it is that a lot of the education time gets kind of uh, uh, subsumed uh, into tech support time, right? So office hours became tech support hours. Well, if you're just running something in a browser, it's not, that's not going to happen right? Because it's just, it's in browser. All right. So there's more that I'd like to show, but uh, I think it's time now for a proper demo. So, and I like the reference to Back to the Future, right? So as I say, where we're going, we will need roads. Um, thank you. Be sure to tip your waitresses. Um, so what we're going to see now is what you're looking at is uh, an instance of Jupiter Lab. And um, what this is, is this is the steps towards open source education. And this is basically the textbook, right? He has a companion website, but this is all tied together through Jupyter Notebooks. And in it, he kind of talks about this. And this guy was the kind of professor you always wanted in school. Because, I mean, this is just like, where did this come from, right? Like, he, he definitely has a, an interesting sense of... Um, how he teaches, um, but he kind of talks about Jupyter books and using Jupyter notebooks as a means to um, to create courseware. And it's fascinating because the textbook companies, now he uses some rather colorful words uh, to describe textbook companies, but ultimately uh, there's been a, um, the this is a field that's, that is, um, that is ripe for disruption, right? And you're seeing this movement happen uh, in regards to, um, uh, you're seeing this movement happen. And one of the things I like to show, uh, I believe it's here, uh, is in his textbooks, he makes reference to another course of textbook. Now, if you were like me, when you're in college, you would, you know, either throw out or sell your old textbooks, uh, to recover some of that cost or lose them all together. Um, but he was able to basically uh, reference this and I was able to do a Git pull uh, from another repo 
and have this textbook available. So if I if I remember, you know what, this was covered in an earlier course. How do I go back to it? It's right here, right? It's all in the surface of this browser and it's extremely easy to get going. And one of the things I like is, you know, here he talks about teaching assembly language and kind of bit registers uh, and how that affects kind of higher level programming languages and where are we. So you can actually have the code because there's a Jupyter Notebook, you can have the code integrated. So it becomes an interactive surface. Fascinating stuff, right? So I can run this. Um, and, you know, there's, this isn't rocket science, but it doesn't have to be. And his whole point is that the whole experience of computer science education, the whole way to learn about computer science has been money gated, right? And is that fair? No, it's not fair, right? It leads to a shortage of computer science. Uh, uh, experts and, and computer scientists. And what is ironic, kind of this is the subtext here, right? It's related to kind of the more abstracted we gotten, um, the more abstract we get from kind of the original, the lower level bits and bytes, the less we understand about it. So it's kind of this irony, ironic trade-off of wider adoption of technology, uh, but more abstraction. Right, but if you're learning computer science, you really have to go down to the actual electrons, so to speak. Right, um, and I have another comment. Oh, promotion of channel. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, my channel is now big enough to get um, my Twitch stream channel is big enough now to uh, to to have people kind of spam bot me. That's cool. See, it's all about how you look at things. All right, so let's go back now to the Jupyter notebook. And I did promise, did I promise this? The multi-armed bandit problem. All right, so this, this conference was in Vegas. So I did this demo um, because I wanted to show the power of this, of this platform, right? The ability to, and I have to run actually one minute ago, but I want to run through this real quick, um, is doing reinforcement learning um, inside a Jupyter Notebook. Um, and Reinforcement learning is the idea you have an environment and you have an agent. And the agent will read the state of the environment, take an action, and then examine the updated state of the environment, and then either get a reward or punishment. Now, how do you reward or punish a bot? Well, that's not exactly clear cut, but stick with me here, right? You have to kind of suspend your little disbelief here. All right, so this is something that uh, is known as the multi-armed bandit problem. And what this is, is you basically, yep, and there's my little fun little graphic there. You want to figure out which bank, which slot machine in a bank of slot machines pays out the most. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bot that will go and explore and try to get as many coins as possible. Now, we'll see that there's kind of a tension between the two of those. All right, so I'm going to move this back down to five because I think at one point I did have it 500 to kind of show how we can do this and i'm going to uh clear all the output clear all outputs so i'm going to run this and if you're not familiar with jupyter notebooks that basically um when when a cell runs you get a number indicating the order in which it ran and if you go and you see um uh, a star that means it's executing, right? I'm not running anything really now that is um, too much, but um, uh, too much processing time, but maybe we'll get to that later. And um, let's see, do I have a message? All right, I'm trying to multitask here. All right, so here's the number of slot machines we're gonna set up for the simulation. Uh, I just pick, you know, using a random seed, I pick five numbers. And I, I create an array um, of a uh, number of slot machines. So it's five. And this is the actual odds. These This is the ground truth. And this is what the agent knows at the start, right? Because nothing, right? It doesn't know anything about the odds. So it just kind of is started up as, as, uh, as zeros. All right. So now I'm going to set up, start building out the simulation, right? Um, define the function of play machine. And what play machine will do uh, is that I'm gonna attempt to do a zoom on this and let's see what happens. Dun, 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 dun. All right. 
Uh, it does make it more readable. I was afraid to do this on stage before. All right, so what this is going to do, the final function called play machine, you get a number of the slot machine. It will randomly pick a number between 0 and 1. If that hits the jackpot's uh, particular payout threshold, you get 10 coins back. If it doesn't, then it takes away 1. All right, now let's go back here. These are the odds of winning, right? So the first uh, slot machine uh, is 54%, then 27%, then 42%, then 84%, and then uh, point, point 0.4%. Uh, all of this to say is that this is kind of a contrived example. Um, if you if no slot machine bank in Vegas or anywhere in the world has this, right? If you do find it, don't call me because we could make some serious bank. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, this is just a contrived example. All right. So what this is going to do is I'm going to test the machine and I'm going to have the iterations here. I'm going to test it, uh, run it 10 times. I'm going to test slot machine four, which had the 84% payout. And I've just five, which had the point four, right? So let's run that. And not surprisingly, we'll see that um, out of the 10 runs, I won on machine four 10 to nine times, lost one, which does kind of jive with the 84%. And not surprisingly, with the 0.4%, uh, it does, um, it cannot win at all, right? Um, now, fun fact, I did for, for giggles, smiles and giggles, um, a, um, I did do uh, run this like a thousand times and it, it does jive like it wins a couple of times it does hit. All right. So now we're going to talk about our concept and reinforcement learning called the epsilon greedy function. And the epsilon greedy function is um, kind of a thing either in game theory. I think it might have originated in game theory, but it's definitely a huge uh, concept in um, in reinforcement learning. And it's the idea of here's the dilemma that the agent faces. Right. And if you've been to a casino, whether that's Atlantic City, Las Vegas, I don't recall seeing too much of this craziness in Monte Carlo, but you would always see someone, usually a pensioner, as they say in Europe, or a senior citizen, uh, smoking a cigarette even. I've seen this a lot in Atlantic City. Smoking a cigarette on an, on an oxygen tank, right? Now, that seems dangerous to me, but you'll always see they always play that same slot machine the whole time, right? This is not a rude gesture. I'm playing thing right they sit they park themselves in one and they never move on now is that really the best strategy well what that is is that there's this two a tension between two forces here and that's represented by the epsilon greedy uh value right explore versus exploit right greed versus curiosity hey i know this slot machine pays out i think it was the first one 54 percent or 45 percent. i know this uh, right i'm just going to keep playing because i know what that is now there's part of us that are probably like, well, what if I found, if I if I didn't do that, I wouldn't find the 84% payout one, right? It could be better. It could be worse, right? And this is a kind of a, a tension between those two forces. All right, so what I'm creating now is I'm creating what's known as a multi, right? So I'm creating a list of slot machines um, that I am going to... Um, I am playing against a list of slot machines. Oh, sorry about that. Multitasking. I, whenever I hit the live stream, everybody in the house has to talk to me. Um, <laughs> uh, so what I'm creating here, let me um, do this. Uh, is I'm creating a, a bank of slot machines, right? And I'm basically taking in how many arms or how many slot machines, how many iterations you want to run, what's the epsilon, right? So all this is going to do is define a function. And what it's going to do, it's going to create a bank of, I think it created a bank of, um, where'd it go? Number of slot machines I set before is five. Iterations I have here set as 1,000. And the epsilon greedy is going to be 10%. So what that means is that 10% of the time, I am going to um, say, you know what? I know that the odds on this slot machine are this. And I know that, uh, but I want to try something else. So 90% of the time, it will, it will act like that old lady in Atlantic City, right? Staying at the one machine. 10% of the time, it'll slide over to, the, to another machine. Um, and we'll see how it goes. 
right? So let's uh, let's run this. And keep in mind, this is going to run this a thousand times. All right. So this is the actual odds. This is the ground truth. But check this out. This is what it's discovered, right? So this this agent figured out the lay of the land pretty accurately. Not perfect, but we'll see that. Um, um, this is the actual is 54%. The actual here is 53%. This is um, 0.8. This is 0.27, right? Not not too dissimilar. Um, it does get a rather pessimistic view of uh, Slot Machine 4. Uh, I'm sorry, the fifth one. Um, but that's interesting. All right, so now let's simulate. Now, I, another thing I want to call your attention to is the rewards, right? So 7,800 is what the what the reward points that it got back. All right, so now we're going to try it with Epsilon Zero. Epsilon Zero means you're just going to exploit, right? You're just going to play one machine and just stay there until the end of time. You're never going to explore anything else, right? Uh, I call this the Atlantic City lady, old lady thing. Um, and we'll see. Well, it really didn't learn anything because it won the first time and it stayed there, right? You also notice that the points are a little lower, about 2,000 lower, 5204. Now, I have noticed uh, in the course of running this demo a number of times, look at this. I'm glad this happened. I could not have planned this better. So what happened here is that um, it played this one. It lost, so it would... It's almost forced to, because it got negative results here, it would explore at random another slot machine, right? So you'll see that once it started getting on a winning streak, so apparently here it lost, it lost, and now it is, now it won on this, and once it found a winner, it did that. This is kind of an interesting behavior that will happen randomly from time to time, and if I run it again, I guarantee you that that's not going to come up. 95 times out of 100, I will I will see this pattern, right? It wins on the first one, and there it goes, and it just stays there. If it loses on the first one, then they'll try the next one, right? That's part of the algorithm that I didn't mention because most of the time this doesn't come up. All right, so now 100%. Now, instead of being greedy, it's going to be curious, right? So it's going to play everything at random, all the slot machines. So let's run that. Now, you'll see that it does do a better job of approximating the actual ground truth, right, of learning the ground truth on its own. However, that comes at a cost, and that cost is the reward. And this is a very crucial thing with, with reinforcement learning because the bot is going to learn things, right? This, is, this goes all the way from, you know, simple type problems like this all the way to uh, alpha, alpha goes zero, which was a reinforcement algorithm. It learned things on its own and based on what it was rewarded with. So you see this a lot in uh, RL systems or reinforcement, reinforcement learning systems. It's time for a water break. All right. So, but you'll notice that as I've tried three values here, right? Uh, an epsilon greedy of 10%, right? Uh, that gives me 7,800 points. Uh, I've tried an epsilon greedy of basically 0%. That gives me about 4,900 points. Uh, that will vary. Let's run it again. Oh, and look, now we have it happened again. Wow, two times uh, <laughs> in one live stream. That that means somebody better buy a lottery ticket because um, the odds of that are happening are very low. But you'll notice the reward is actually pretty low. The reward on this tends to top out around 3,000, 3,200 or 5,000, 5, I'm sorry, yes, uh, 4,800, let's see. Oh, it keeps happening. And that's totally blowing my hypothesis. This is the problem. Oh, man. Okay, now it's just messing with me. This is what I expect. You say 4,800, that's about what I would expect. So this tends to get about 7,500 to 8,000. This tends to um, get... 4,800. But I guess there, there, there it is, right? Like, you know, people like, I got to play that one slot machine. You got to play that one slot machine. Uh, sometimes that does actually work out. It's not, as I like to say, it's not impossible. It's just improbable. All right. So here's kind of this thing I had where 
we only tested three values. We tested kind of um, the stated ideal, right, which is 10%. And we tested out kind of the, the two polar extremes, right, zero and one. So this got me thinking. I was um, wondering, like, um, always wanted to do this, right? I always want to add this. Like, well, what is the ideal value of epsilon greedy to maximize your points, um, maximize your reward? So that got me thinking, like, how would I do this, right? So I happened to be stuck in the, in the airport in Houston and was like, I wrote this. And um, uh, so here's what we find out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run values of epsilon greedy and varying in one one hundredth increments from zero to one. And I'm going to run the simulation and just see what happens and then plot those graphs um, and then plot the rewards based uh, on the height axis. So it should be the um, vertical axis and the, the horizontal axis will be from zero to one, your epsilon greedy value. All right. So let's let's kick this off. Hopefully you can still hear my audio. All right. So you'll see. All right. So this is a bit of an anomaly. Um, but generally, the trend line is that the more curious you get, the lower your rewards. Um, so let's run that again. This is closer to what I would expect. So as you get to about 10 to 15 percent on your epsilon greedy, which means 10 to 15 percent of the time you are curious and explorative. Uh, you tend to maximize your rewards more or less as yet as that curiosity expands um, when your greed goes up um, you get you get more um, you get more returns so you'll see if you're completely greedy which would be an epsilon of zero you you really have no visible benefit uh, as you get to a greed value of around, you know, 10%, um, 10 percent curious, so that would be 90% greedy, somewhere between 85 and 90% greedy, that's when you get your maximum value. So turns out Gordon Gecko was right, but only about 80% of the time. Um, so you'll see if you can run this again and again, you will see some kind of outliers, statistical uh, uh, anomalies, but for the most part, you will see that um by and large the trend is it tends to top out around somewhere between 10 and 15 percent so with that um thanks for tuning in for this live stream i want i was talking on for about 30 minutes uh definitely give me a give me a shout if you thought this was valuable if you're watching this live put hashtag live if you're watching this on the replay Drop in hashtag replay if you have any questions or there's something else you'd like to see me demonstrate on Rhodes um, or Red Hat OpenShift Data Science or anything Red Hat, really. Um, let me know and I can, I can make it happen. So with that, I'm going to end the stream and say thank you very much for tuning in for the latest edition of Fedora Friday.